Good morning. Thank you for tuning in to Sam at Pam, where science and art meet at the Portland Art Museum. So this afternoon, morning, um, we are talking about um, planning to save your personal archives or your personal papers. Um, and we are here talking about that, this topic, because it is National Preparedness Month. And um, while we recognize that preparedness Really, you should focus on um, preparing your house and yourselves for taking care of the people mm -hmm. and <laughs> um, making sure that you are ready to um, you know, take care of the, um, keep yourself safe, keep yourself safe yeah. and um, all of these things. Um, if you've already gotten all of that uh, taken care of and you um, are an eager beaver, um, we have some tips for you for how to take care of kind of your memories mm -hmm. and make sure that you have some measures in place to prepare your archives and make sure that those are um, prepared in case there's an event um, and um, make sure that those will survive during um, an emergency event or a disaster. Um, so. We should introduce ourselves before we get too far ahead of ourselves into the, to the event. Um, so my name is Samantha Springer, and I am the conservator here at the Art Museum. And um, so I'll, I um, will let Hi. Jessica introduce herself. Yeah. I'm Jessica McIntyre. I'm the librarian and archivist here at the museum. Um, why don't you uh, tell everybody what you do here, what your mm. job is here, and then I can yeah. try it and t okay. we can try and figure, tell everybody kind of what the difference is between our roles here yeah. at the museum. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that museums have libraries and they have archives. Um, and so I uh, work in both. So I have um, not only resources for research about objects in the collection and uh, art in general, um, but also our institutional record and our institutional memory here. So I have the history of the museum in the archives. And so I do um, preservation uh, in, in conjunction with Samantha, and we have a disaster team here as well across the museum. And uh, so we have plans in place together, um, but I also rely a lot on Samantha's expertise in actual conservation because I don't typically do that. I do more of the preparation work and um, avoiding, avoiding harm <laughs> to our collections. Um, yeah, and we should point out that we have, um, I mean, we're not the only two people who work in this area. We have um, other collections, um, or team members in the collections mm. department who also work directly with the art collection um, and in the mm. library to kind of help manage with all of this work. Um, so I'm the conservator here, and actually my specialty is in sculpture and 3D material. Um, um, it's my job to kind of oversee the care of the art collection, and so the collection um, in the museum has uh, over 50,000 works, and we have um, about half are actually works of art on paper. Um, we also have paintings and sculpture, and um, so it's a really wide variety of materials. Um, and it's a really nice overlap with the archives and the library. Um, and it's really nice that we're working together in order to kind of um, plan for different types of potential um, disasters and other, I, I, would, yeah. I mean, we're calling them disasters, but they can also be small little events. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. I mean, we talk, they can be really a big wide range. It could be major kind yeah. of um, natural disaster events um, where yeah. we have, like we've been hurricanes. <laughs> Um, Not here in yeah, Portland. Yeah. <laughs> um, like forest fires, um, uh, the, there have been a lot of those nearby recently, mm -hmm. um, but they can also be an earthquake, um, but it can also be small, like a small pipe 
burst, um, a small flood mm -hmm. um, inside of the building. So we're talking about a lot preparedness for a lot of different kinds of um, a range, wide range of different events. Yeah, anything that could harm our collections. Yeah, and so uh, in in a good way, I guess we had a disaster plan in place, um, and so when we did have a water event in our archives, so that's our, uh, the institutional records is, is what's contained in the archives. So it's the um, history of our, um, our directors, the history of our exhibitions, photographs, uh, books, um, lots of documentation, correspondence, letters, things like that. Um, so we had a, a small water event and it wasn't a natural disaster and it wasn't a huge disaster, but um, it did, uh, it did affect some of our unprocessed collections. So that was, um, unprocessed collections are uh, things that have come to the archives, but they um, haven't been prioritized to be fully housed properly yet. Yeah, so, so maybe you haven't like state. sorted them yeah, and sorted figured them. out where they go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a way this is a good thing because um, that collection had already been deprioritized for processing. Um, so we knew in some ways, at least most of it was um, maybe not uh, the heart of our collection here. And so um, we got a good chance to practice our disaster <laughs> plan uh, yes. and put that into place. And uh, so we can share that with you a little bit today uh, to help in your, your um, safekeeping of your records too. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we really, and I should just let you all know that for those of you who are watching, if you have any questions, please um, just post them in the comments section and um, we will answer them as we go along during the live video. Um, and also any questions that we don't get to um, during the video, um, uh, just leave them there and we'll answer them after the end of the session. Um, so, um, sorry, yeah, I so we had got some, a little uh, bit lost. <laughs> <laughs> no, was, so we had some, um, so we had some records. They were mostly in um, larger boxes, and those had a water event happen to them. And oh, so yeah. we yeah. had the whole. We had a disaster team in place. And yeah, they came in, and then we um, we took some some measures. Or should we talk yeah. about? I think it, prep first. Yeah, or yeah. Go right so into I think the, it, it okay. would be good to talk about. Um, you know, what people can do at home in order to prepare. So since the month is about um, preparedness, like what, are you, what can you do at home in order mm -hmm. to prevent any um, damage from happening to your um, kind of your personal treasures mm -hmm. so that you don't have to actually carry out any salvage. And then later yeah, on we can avoid kind of, it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you can avoid it from happening. And then later on we can talk about, you know, in the unfortunate event that mm -hmm. something does happen, then like what are some of the things that you can kind of do in order to take care of your um, treasures in case. And yeah. we are really gonna focus on water events that's our yeah. euphemism for when your stuff gets wet, um, because that is really the most common kind of, um, yeah. the most common event that, yeah. or disaster that happens. Mm -hmm. So it's related to, if there's a fire, you know, the, um, yeah, the firefighters, firefighters will, will come and they're gonna use water to put the fire out. I assume they do it like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was emotional. <laughs> yeah. Um, if there's a, if it's raining and there's a hurricane, there's a leak, you know, the water is going to come into the house. Mm -hmm. You have a pipe burst. Um, from construction. From construction, Anything you're like going to have water come in. Mm -hmm. um, this is really just like yeah. the most common thing to happen um, in your home or even in, unfortunately, in the museum world too. Yeah, especially in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We get a lot so of that's what we're going to focus on here today. Yeah. Yeah, and primarily documents and photographs because that was the bulk of the collection um, and, and that's pretty typically what most people have the most of. Yeah, um, we have some, we'll post some um, resources, online resources, and there is some information on kind of what you can do to prep, prepare and how to take care of um, other 
uh, materials um, and you know, maybe that we can talk about that at some other date if there's interest. Um, but all of these topics are enormous, so they, we can't really get into all of them right now. Yeah. Um, okay. So. so okay. <laughs> if <laughs> if, uh, if I had a collection, um, I would want to first make sure that the environment that it was in was stable and was pretty safe. To, to, to begin with, so that uh, it wasn't under the pipes that might burst, it wasn't uh, by a window. Um, basements and attics and garages are actually really bad for keeping records and storing them. Um, there are a lot of fluctuations in the temperature in those, and then there's also a lot of exposure to windows or the roof line. Um, in the basement, of course, there might be flooding, there might be yeah. guns, mold, things like that. Yeah, so this might feel like a really common sense thing, but um, knowing um, kind of what the most likely kind of natural events um, um, that might occur in your area are mm -hmm. um, is kind of important. But then also like taking care of the, um, the shell or the your house, mm -hmm. <laughs> making sure that your documents and your archives are stored in uh, a housing that's well cared for mm -hmm. is kind of like the first step. So is it in, um, you know, making sure that there are no leaks, nat uh, neat leaks, um, places for water to infiltrate mm -hmm. in the room that they're stored in yeah. or um, that's in a box that is not going to get, um, yeah, get leaks into leaks it. Into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have a couple of examples to show yeah. like kind of like how we store things at the museum and then how maybe you could do it at home. Yeah. And then, sorry, yeah. yeah go so ahead. if I, uh, if I'm storing my records, um, I would try to not keep them directly on the floor that uh, that might um, flood, it might be um, subject to seepage if it's in the basement especially. Um, so not on the floor and not all the way at the ceiling, which might be a fire issue. Um, so I would keep it sort of on a shelf in the middle of the room or something, um, not on an exterior wall. And then uh, here, in the archives, we store everything in boxes. So these are archival boxes. These are from, can we say, should we say who we, we bought sure. these from Hollinger? <laughs> so these are Hollinger boxes. I like them because uh, they're very sturdy, they're archival, um, and then they, they fit really nicely on the shelf. And um, you can see that they fit uh, standard size paper really easily. Um, and then we have folders within them. So the folders are archival as well. Um, and you don't want to just, you know, cram, them sh cram it full because uh, you want a little bit of space in there, especially if something gets water damaged. Uh, once it soaks up the water, paper will expand. And so that could cause, um, you know, cause this to burst open. If it's, um, if it's books on a shelf and those are archival, like if, you, um, if they're historical or if they are a treasure of yours, something that is a record, that you want to keep. So if, if those books are special to you or archival, um, you would want to give them enough space on the shelf that if they did expand and absorb some water that they wouldn't um, knock the shelf over or, um, you know, they can bust through wood. They can, they they can really, really have a lot strong. of force. Yeah. 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 So, so this is what we use here, the, so, the paper boxes. Yeah, so we're throwing this word um, archival around. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we should just delve into that a little bit. <laughs> what does archival mean? <laughs> and, or, and what does museum quality mean? Um, and do you yeah. need archival materials at home yourself? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that um, you will need to think about a little bit. So archival for us is um, acid-free. And are those lignin-free also? Yeah. yeah. OK, so lignin. Um, is a part of the wood that will damage, um, create acid over time. It's like a lower quality part of the, um, the tree, wood, um, pulp 
that is detrimental to um, the, that's detrimental that basically is a lower quality and it will break down. Mm -hmm. So it means that this like kind of housing will cause damage to the documents over time. Mm -hmm. um, and acid free because the acid will also cause damage. Yeah, so and, discolors and yes, yeah, so um, if you think about if like newspaper, it turns yellow and brown, um, it's not, it's a lower quality paper and it, um, it breaks down over time relatively quickly as opposed to like your 100% cotton bond paper, which you might buy for to print your resume on. Um, it's a much higher quality paper because it has less of this acidic um, and lignin and other um, material in it that is, um, doesn't last as long. And so what we're trying to use are these higher quality materials because our archives, mm -hmm hence the word archival, <laughs> our I archives are meant to, we're trying to house them in a way that will last for a really long time. So um, in terms of do you need these materials to house your own personal records, um, I think it really depends on what they are. Are they your tax forms and you only need them to last, you know, Seven, seven years, years yeah. or whatever, um, then maybe that doesn't need to be archival, but mm -hmm. it needs to be um, longer lasting. Um, so, but if they are your mementos from your grandparents' mm -hmm. photographs and um, things that are like irreplaceable, irreplaceable super valuable. Um, yeah, so those are the kinds of things that you would want to put in maybe in mm -hmm. these archival materials because you want them to, you want to be able to pass them down to your grandchildren, that kind of thing. And so in terms of um, kind of protecting your personal archive, um, one of the steps in terms of preparing your preparing is deciding what's replaceable and what isn't. And that's a really important yeah. step, and it's something that we have to go through, too. And kind of prioritizing mm -hmm. in what's advance most what's most valuable yeah. and what's worth your time. Yep. What's, worth, what's worth the resources. Yeah. Oh, question. Oh, we have a question from the audience. Yes, we have a question that has come in. Uh, we have a question from uh, Tom Smith, and they would like to know, uh, how should I store posters? Oh. oh, this is a really good question, and a little bit complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also relates to the point you were just making, because there, I think of two, um, two ways that you might store posters. Okay. Um, here, uh, we you know, use these boxes, and you can get these in all different sizes. And I do have, um, we have really large boxes, flat boxes, so we can store the posters flat in those. Um, but you could also roll them, and they do sell archival um, tubes that you could put them in. And so that might be another option that wouldn't preserve it in as pristine a condition because it might get, you know, the curve over time. Um, but if you don't roll it too tightly, if you roll it around uh, a tube. Yeah, um, I would say the bigger uh, diameter yeah. tube, the biggest diameter tube that you can roll it around, yeah. the better. Um, mm -hmm. But again, thinking about what, what do you want to do with the posters um, is, the imp is an important first step. Mm -hmm. So deciding how often do you want to access them um, and yeah. Um, what, what is it that you want to do with them? So if you don't need to access them often, maybe having them in a tube and do you, how much space do you have um, yeah. and how many posters do you have? <laughs> is it only a few or do you, um, do you have many, many posters? Um, so that can help you decide, do you have the space to have them out flat? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say for the posters longevity having them out um, having them in a flat um, yeah. housing is better um, but if you don't have the space having them in, on an archival roll mm -hmm. it can be um, can be an okay way to store them as well 
Yeah, and even if it's not an archiving role, I think um, that might be a cheaper way to go too, is uh, if it's in a any tube, but then if you're able to uh, put acid-free paper around it and just sort of sandwich it between some acid-free paper and then put that into the tube, that might be um, a more affordable way to do yeah, that. Yeah, to, um, to have it on a plastic, I'm typically I oh, yeah. um, steer away from plastics, um, but to have it on um, a polyethylene or polypropylene roll, um, mm -hmm. that is better than having it on a um, acidic cardboard roll. Um, so one thing we do is like if we have an acidic cardboard roll, we would put a barrier layer to prevent the acids from actually coming in and, and leaching mm -hmm. out to get to the... Precious poster. Pre yeah, <laughs> precious poster, yeah. Um, so I also wanted to show, like, at home you might have put your, instead of having this archi archival cardboard box, you might have, like, a plastic bin. Um, I do this at That's home. That's actually what I do at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it, like if there was to be a leak in my in my um, in my closet, um, this would protect everything in it from getting wet. So, um, like all of my photos and stuff are in inside of the plastic bin, and so then um, it can't get wet. So these bins are really nice. Um, some of them even have seals, so then you don't have to worry about if there's um, high humidity, you won't get um, mold or anything growing inside mm -hmm. of it. Um, so that's another yeah. thing to do. Um, so once you have prioritized and you have some housing, um, organizing, <laughs> I know, organizing yeah, yeah, your, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not just throwing it all into the box, but then mm -hmm. like, Labeling, yeah, and labeling, so you know you, you can go back and find it. So, Very Jessica, important. you have some tips for how we should label? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, so obviously, writing labels on the folders is nice. Um, if you don't buy a folder, um, well, wherever you write a label, I would write it in pencil, because pencil doesn't run with, when it gets uh, water on it. Um, but ink will get, um, will get blurry, it'll run, uh, and then it fades over time too. And also I think Sharpies fade over time yeah, as well. Yeah, this so is a really funny misnomer when, yeah. <laughs> even though Sharpie is a permanent ink, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's permanent up to a certain point, but it will fade um, with light exposure, so it's actually not very permanent. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I don't know, I think I just thought of that because I think I get somewhat annoyed when I see labels that aren't in pencil, but also um, I wanted to mention not to use rubber bands. Rubber bands are really horrible <laughs> in like three years. They don't last very long and then they stick to everything. And then you get just bits of rubber band and what you had intended to keep together doesn't actually stay together at all. So um, it, it's really annoying to find those um, and then to find that what you had, you know, preserved together isn't together. So yeah. no rubber bands, staples, and paper clips as well. Um, those are less bad, but they do tend to, if there's any humidity, any moisture in there, they'll rust. So, um, yeah. and then they also damage the page, you know, they um, bend it in. So um, I would just use a piece of paper, usually copy paper is acid free. Um, and so just, you know, just make a little folder out of paper and then you can also write your label on the paper. Um, and that's a great way to just divide things or keep them together. Yeah. Oh, you know, I just thought, it, since you mentioned that copy paper is acid free, um, if you have any articles, like newspaper articles, mm -hmm. that you, maybe yeah. your kid or your, um, I don't know, somebody in your family there was a newspaper article written about or there's something that you want to keep there was, yeah. that was an important part um, and you have it mm -hmm. and um, you want to keep it in your own archive or yeah. personal records. Um, actually, instead of cutting the article out 
and keeping it. The best way to keep a record of that is actually to make a photocopy of it mm -hmm. and then keep the photocopy because the copy paper will last way longer than the newspaper. Yeah. yeah. Just a little tip. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a reminder that we are, this is Sam at Pam's where science and art meet at the Portland Art Museum and we're here with um, Jessica McIntyre, our librarian and archivist and um, I'm Samantha Springer, the conservator here and if you have any questions for us, um, please leave them in the comments section and we're talking about protecting your personal archives. Um, do we have a question from the audience? We do. We have several questions that are coming in about um, supplies uh, that relate to photos getting wet. Okay. So this might be a good opportunity to transition to yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in preparing for uh, to avoid a water event, um, first obviously keep it in in whatever housing, if it's a plastic bin or if it's a, um, an archival box. Um, start there and then I had an example um, so some plastics are really good for yeah, um, yeah which ones are really, I want to say the poly poly oh yeah, yeah. And polyethylene polyethylene oh, yeah polyester which is also known as mylar and we can leave these names um, at the end um, we can put these names into the I don't know if it'll be in the comment section or in the description. Um, so poly, um, yeah, mylar. So these um, sleeves, the document sleeves, um, also yeah. these photo. Uh, yeah, these are specifically photo these sleeves. Are, these are photo sleeves. And there are a couple of um, online vendors that sell these um, materials for, mm -hmm. um, a, a Gaylord, Gaylord and Hollinger, Hollinger and um, there's another big one that I'm blanking on the name of right now, but we will definitely <laughs> put those in the, the description yeah. section. Um, and so these plastic, these are good plastics. They don't have any plasticizers in them. So over time, plasticizers are, um, smaller mole molecules in plastics that make plastics flexible. And so over time, they leach out and become sticky. And so those are things that you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. I'm probably m some of you might know about this. And those of you who don't, don't worry, we'll put all of that information onto the description section um, so that you can avoid them. And I think we had, didn't we have a clip of us checking some, uh, when our records were in, Oh this yeah, water we can event. bring that up. Um, some of our, a lot of the photos were actually in photo sleeves. And uh, so the, one of the first things we did when we were uh, removing the items from the area that had the water event, uh, we, we had to check to see which, um, which records were actually damaged and which were not. And so we have a clip of us just peering in to see if, um, if they did in fact stick. Yeah, so having them in the plastic sleeves, it allowed the water to kind of, you can see, so some of the, uh, those photos were really easy to remove, so the water just shed off of the, the plastic um, prevented the water from getting into the photos, so that was really great in that it um, protected those photos from getting wet and it, um, made it really easy to remove them from the plastic sleeves. Um, in another case, the sleeve, the water did infiltrate and it got into the sleeve and so we had to really carefully peel it off. But in that case, you know, it still prevented the photo from sticking to other photos mm -hmm. that were in the stack. So yeah. it's still, even though we had to really carefully peel it off, um, it still prevented it from getting stuck to other photos. So mm -hmm. it was, um, nice to have it that in that way yeah and um, def yeah let's see oh in video one. Oh yes this yeah is video. yes exactly in this video so you can see i'm checking in this area to see and using this really soft not um <clears throat> synthetic bristle brush um and some filtered water 
in order to clean the surface of the photo and then slowly peel back the, um, the photo sleeve. Um, Yeah, because so, the front of yeah. uh, photos, when they get wet, they become sticky. And so when you store them, you want to store them not face together. Um, you want to store them uh, so that all the fronts are facing the same way, so that they, they won't stick. In some cases, they stick no together. No matter what. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then that's back to the labeling point. Um, also, don't use glue or anything to stick a sticker on the back. Um, probably don't even use stickers, just stick with pencil. So when people write on the back who, who is in the picture, that's great. Um, that's probably the best way. Um, yeah, in the margin somewhere, that's good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so photographs have a layer of gelatin. Well, let's not not contemporary photographs, they're printed differently, but historical photographs, silver gelatin, um, most black and white photographs there um, have a layer of gelatin on the front and that's when, so when it gets wet, it reactivates and gets sticky again. So that's mm -hmm. what is getting stuck. So we have another question from the audience. So Locust1919 would like to know if my photos get wet and are stuck together, should I try to wash them and pull them apart myself? That is a really good question. Um, so I would say um, that is a very um, uh, kind of, I would say it depends, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is one of my favorite answers. <laughs> um, so um, in most cases, I would say probably not, but it really depends on your level of comfort. Um, so, like, for people who are um, really comfort comfortable, who are photographers, mm -hmm. like who work with photography and who are um, have done a lot of processing of photographs. I don't know how many people out there still have yeah. worked in a dark room. Yeah. Um, that they probably could um, still do this. But um, if you have had a water event and you haven't gotten to your photos right away, so this is a great yeah. time to move into some of the salvage. Um, one of the first things, so if you have photos and they've gotten wet, while they're still wet, you can pull them apart pretty easily mm -hmm. um, if they're not stuck. And what you can do is interleave them with um, wax paper and then um, let them, and then put them in a plastic bag and then freeze them until you have space to pull them apart and let them dry. Yeah. But if you haven't, if you have not been able to do that and they've gotten stuck together and they are dry, um, then don't try and get them wet and pull them apart yourself. Um, I would definitely seek out professional help for those kinds of things. Um, but if you, if they've just gotten wet and you have um, you have entered the situation immediately, mm -hmm. um, as what happened with our event here, um, we had a team all working together and mm -hmm. um, everybody was kind of assessing as they went and pulling things to get apart. There were a few that um, were kind of stuck and so um, we left those alone. Every, uh, our team yeah. kind of left those alone, um, set those aside, and then I worked on those. Yeah, um, yeah so freezing yeah. them for, for the ones that needed more in-depth work, um, like yeah. the ones that were stuck John, together. we can pull up the video we, of the uh, bathing um, yeah. and pulling the stack of photos. Sorry, that's but it, um, five, video five. And so right after the event, we, we realized that this would require Samantha to do a water bath. Um, which, yeah, yeah thank you. you wanna... So, sorry, go ahead. Oh, just that so we froze these right away um, because we didn't have time to do this process immediately. Yeah, um, so and there was a large please. number. Yeah. Yeah, so doing this um, <clears throat> takes a long time. And so if we were, well, if I was, you know, unsticking this one stack, there were, 50 other photos that needed attention, they would be drying out and 
other condition issues would be occurring. Um, and so I wouldn't have time to get to them. So freezing them kind of just stops the process um, and allows us to deal with them in a slower way. Yeah, um, and as many times as you can uh, interleave wax paper in between them, um, yeah. that helps when they um, go into the freezer and come out of the freezer so that more things aren't getting stuck while they are yeah. waiting. And so part of the process that you started to see in that video, and we can also bring up um, video two, was we were, after they get washed and we were able to pull the photos apart, we were laying the photos into a drying stack. Um, and so here in this video, you can see I'm laying them out onto a, a white board there. What, it's actually blotter paper with a piece of Holytex, which is um, a non-woven synthetic fabric or a spun bond polyester. Um, so the, that um, polyester fabric is not sticky, so the photos will not stick to it. So I put another layer on top um, so that the gelatin won't stick. I put another piece of blotter paper on top, and this wicks and pulls all of the moisture out so that the photos will dry more quickly. And then I'm pulling out a piece of corrugated board, which is just like a, um, some, another stiff board in order to create um, something, a flat surface. And so here I have all of the materials here. And so we call this a drying stack. Sandwich. It's a sandwich. sandwich. Yeah. So I have all of the materials here. Um, and so after I create this sandwich, then we would just repeat the process and keep going. And then at the end, put weights on here in order to create, keep everything flat. And so that allows us to dry the photos. In, and also you can do this with documents. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> allows everything to dry in really flat way. And then you have to switch out the blotters because they get wet and then you want to put in dry ones so that you don't, things don't get moldy and you're drying things as quickly as possible. So we have, I think we have another question. So this is the other part of Locus's, Locus 1919's question. Uh, they ask, what are some supplies I can have around the house in case of a flood and my photos get wet? So you just showed a couple of materials, but yeah. those might be um, museum quality materials. Is there something that um, a DIYer could get? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I think one of the things that, like, Maybe you have a roll of wax paper at home. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things that you can have, um, a, like a little stash. Um, instead of blotter paper, paper towels mm -hmm. is a really great absorbent material to have around. So if you're like me and you stock up when paper towels are on sale, like you can have a stash of paper towels and use those. Um, we also use those um, interleaving into books, so in between the pages if any books had been um, wet, but paper towels are great for that too. Yeah, and I just wanted to show one technique, so um, if we pretend that something got wet over there, Jessica. Yeah, this. yeah. so say this, um, say this magazine got wet, then I might take the, my paper towels and then put it on top and blot on top, don't take them and rub. Because once your paper gets wet, it will pull up all of the paper fibers and you really want to blot the paper out. As soon as, your, as soon as your paper towel gets wet, throw it away, grab something else, and then blot it again. Diapers, <laughs> old cloth <laughs> diapers are super absorbent and really amazing, <laughs> reusable. Um, so they're, I mean, as long as they're clean, um, they're really great. Uh, I mean, clean towels, all of those kinds of things in the, for yeah. uh, flooding and leaks, those are important absorbent materials that you can use. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, thinking about replicating these kinds of flat absorbent materials and then something else that, so then, once it gets wet and damp, 
then you want to pull it out and then replace it with something else that's dry. Um, so, yeah, and in this case, it might be, I might be wrong here, but I would imagine that it's less vital to have archival quality materials yeah. because it's a temporary process. So you're not going to be storing them in there. You're really just getting them dry and getting them out of there. Yeah, definitely. And you don't want anything to sit, um, was it 72 hours? Oh, um, yeah. So yeah, so if anything yeah. is getting, if, if it's going to be um, wet for more than 72 hours or a couple days, um, get it into, get it in wax paper, get it in a bag, and put it in the freezer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so that mold won't grow. Yeah, and this um, this polyester fabric is really important for photographs because they have that gelatin layer that's sticky. Mm -hmm. But for documents that are just paper, it's not as important. So just interleaving with the paper towels or some sort of absorbent material is fine. Or um, when you have having fans around, mm -hmm. anything to move. Um, Get the airflow. Yeah, when you have a water event. Um, one of the primary things that you want to prevent is mold growing. So um, mold wants high humidity, still air, and warmth. So if you can lower the temperature, get air moving, and lower the humidity, you are doing really great. So if you can get fans and air moving, then you can break that cycle for mold to grow. Um, so if you have, um, I don't want to do it with this, but if you have, um, if you have books that get wet, um, one of the things that you can do are like stand them on end and fan them out. Yeah. Just to make sure it's open. So yeah. you might tend to want to lay it flat so that it wouldn't wrinkle. Um, but really it's going to be so much quicker to yeah. dry. So you might you end up with your book getting, having wrinkled pages, um, but if you open it up and allow it to dry, you're going to prevent it from getting moldy, and that's way more important than the fact that your pages are wrinkly. Yeah. Yes, there's one more question. We have a question from Tom Smith, and this is regarding books. Uh, what tape should I use to fix a torn page in a book? And then also he uh, asks, or they ask, how do I reattach a book cover that has fallen off? I get this question a lot. Do you? <laughs> no, not question? as not <laughs> no? as much because I, they're asking me more about <laughs> art <laughs> questions. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, I would tend not to use tape. Uh, don't use any adhesive, in part because it'll um, over time it won't last like a rubber band. Um, and then also, if it gets water damaged, it might stick to other things. Um, or if it gets hot, it might stick to other things. If you're storing things in your attic like you shouldn't, uh, it might, might cause them to stick. Um, so I would just tie it up with string and um, just tie it around both sides like a present and um, then store it like that. Or you could create an enclosure. Um, you could just keep it in one of these little sleeves like this one was stored. And that'll hold it together, uh, and then that'll protect it also from any potential water. So. Yeah, what else are we? Um, Where are we let's at here? See. <laughs> so we were saying <laughs> airflow. Yeah. Freeze oh, it a bit. Um, so I think one of the only other things that we really wanted to cover today was. Um, you know, we talked a lot about physical um, photos and documents and books and papers, but we didn't talk about digital files at all. So um, it's not That's necessarily. Big, yeah, yeah. Oh, we have one <laughs> other okay, question good. before we <laughs> delve into before the we digital move on world. To digital, okay. Uh, <laughs> we have a question uh, from uh, Rachel, and they ask if somehow mold does get on papers, what should we do? Oh. oh. Okay, well, first of all, you should protect yourself. So um, you want to make sure, it, I mean, it, it depends on how much mold there is. Um, you want to make sure that you have um, personal protection. So you don't want to breathe in the mold. You can wear um, kind of a mask. And if you can get a HEPA vacuum or a filter for your vacuum, um, that's really great. 
And I think a lot of vacuums these days have that built in. Yeah. So I got one that was yes. already built or in. Or like for so. shop vacs, they yeah. have um, relatively inexpensive um, filters that you can put onto your vacuum. Um, and so that will prevent, so when you vacuum up the um, mold spores, that will prevent them from spreading out. Mm -hmm. um, and so you really don't want to breathe it in. So what you can do, I mean, if it's really small, you can wipe it up. Um, what you, you don't want to, what can happen if you're wiping it up, though, is that it can smear. Um, what you want to make sure that it's dry first. So you want to lower the humidity. You want to dry it out. Make sure that your whatever is wet and got moldy, make sure it's dry mm -hmm. first. Um, and then you can use a soft brush and brush it. I should have had a soft brush here. But anyway, like um, watercolor brushes are really great for this. Um, a soft brush and turn your vacuum down low if you can, but hold the vacuum away and then brush the mold into the vacuum. So you never want to put the vacuum hose onto your object to suck it up, um, but you can um, really gently kind of dust or yeah, move the, the um, dust or mold Towards the Towards vacuum. The vacuum. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that would be my. Um, yeah. And then I stop mean, storing it in the basement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, there's mold spores everywhere. Yeah, yeah but and they only grow when it when the moisture when exactly. the humidity is. is they high grow enough. when things get wet and the humidity is high enough. So yeah. the thing to do to prevent stuff from getting moldy is to reduce the humidity. If it's gotten moldy dry it out, and then you can clean it and protect yourself. Um, so, so digital yeah. files don't get moldy. Digital <laughs> files don't get moldy. I mean, your they thumb are drive could get moldy. <laughs> but why are you storing it on a thumb drive? I don't, yeah, oh, well, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so digital files are, um, they might, they are maybe somewhat less susceptible to some of the physical, uh, environmental problems that some of uh, the physical objects might have. Maybe but not power outages. Not power <laughs> outages, not uh, migrations to new, uh, new software, things like that. There are a lot of reasons why digital files might get corrupt, might get lost. Um, and so it's a huge topic. The one thing, I think we had one thing to say basically about, about digital files. Um, well, two, don't store it on a thumb drive. Store it. <laughs> <laughs> or don't store, only store, store it, it on a thumb only, drive. Yeah. Yeah. Store it somewhere else, um, somewhere more stable. Duplicate. Than that. We have duplicate a couple, yeah. the files. <laughs> and also make sure that those duplications are geographically dispersed. Back it up. Back it up in different locations. So with Google, on your home computer, and then maybe one other place. Yeah. Um, that's not either of those places. So yeah. So it wouldn't work to have, you know, your files on a server in the basement and then also on your computer. That's or, less stable. Yeah. If your backup is right next if you have you right know, next to it. If two, they're right next to each other. Drives, yeah. That's not a backup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're um, not a good one. I mean yeah. Kudos for you for putting it on something else, but then That's you true. need to get it sep them separated because, you know, if there's a power outage or if there's a flood, yeah. they're gonna they're both going down. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you so much for um, tuning in. And again, we're gonna put the links to all of those guides from the AIC, which is the American Institute for Conservation, um, FEMA, the DC Public Library. Um, they're in the YouTube um, description. And if you have any questions after the episode, feel free to leave them as a comment and we'll get back to you. Um, and thank you so much for spending your time with us today. For Sam and Pam, we yeah. really enjoyed talking with you today. I hope you're not and talking to each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, Sam and Pam is where science and art meet at the Portland Art Museum. Until next time.